This video introduces CITW Strategy 8, Identifying Similarities and Differences. Before I go any further, I'm going to have a friend lead off and put this strategy into perspective for you. I think you'll agree that my friend has an undeniable genius when it comes to making sense of the world. Hi, hey, do you want to play a game now? Okay, here, I help. One of these things is not like the other things. One of these things just doesn't belong. Can you guess which thing is not like the other thing? Before I finish my song. Now look closely. Look. Now something here. One of these things does not belong. Now I'll give you a hint. It has to do with how many cookies are on each plate. Okay? You ready? No? Okay, keep looking. I look too. It's hard even for a monster. Keep looking. Oh, did you guess? Oh, yeah? Did you guess which thing is not like the other things? Did you guess with all your might? If you guessed that this thing is not like the other things, you know what? You know what? You're right. Oh, you're absolutely right. You're so smart. Unfortunately, I lack the charm and the charisma of Cookie Monster, and I'm sorry about that. But I think it's obvious that the creators of Sesame Street were onto something long before Robert Marzano came along and identified his nine best teaching practices. Research indicates that of the nine CITW strategies, number eight is a particularly powerful one. In fact, the authors of Classroom Instruction That Works describe identifying similarities and differences as the core of all learning, which is a bold statement but I don't actually think it's an exaggeration, especially once you understand everything that's involved. Whenever a teacher asks her students to identify similarities and differences, she's asking them to use their existing knowledge to make sense of the world. Strategy 8 helps students connect ideas and concepts, and it helps move them from concrete to abstract levels of thinking. When a student draws inferences or makes generalizations, he's creating or refining schemas or neural pathways which increases the likelihood that in the future when he encounters more new information he'll be able to make sense of it. And this strategy is another one that helps move students away from right answer learning toward the kind of higher level thinking that we see in Bloom's taxonomy and that we want at DAA. So this strategy really is, is rather logical, and I think it's also important to realize that every teacher in the school, regardless of what or where you teach, probably uses this strategy often. Now let's take a look at how strategy eight fits in Bloom's taxonomy. Remember, as always, I'm focused on the question of what great teachers do differently. Let's start with the idea of a CUD sort, which is a technique for sorting learning objectives. The acronym CUD just stands for Know, Understand, and Do. Scott Wilcox has done CUD sorts with a few different teams this year and has really challenged thinking around the outcomes of high quality assessments. The idea is that all learning objectives can be classified broadly. What do we want our students to know? What do we want our students to understand? And what do we want our students to be able to do? Remember that there's an important difference between know and understand. Knowing refers to recall of information or data, while understanding refers to why something is important. Obviously, these broad categories fit perfectly with Bloom's taxonomy. Hopefully, it's clear now that two of the nine CITW strategies play a particularly important role in moving students to the highest levels of Bloom's. Strategy eight, identifying similarities and differences, and strategy nine, generating and testing hypotheses. However, please keep this image in mind. When students don't have a solid foundation in what they know and understand, they have little chance of succeeding with the higher levels of thinking. All right, now let's bring this down to a very practical level. Uh, one of the great things about classroom instruction that works is the thoroughness of the meta-analysis that was conducted in 2010. This quote actually refers to the conclusions of two other studies, and you can see the parenthetical referencing at the end of the sentence. I'll give you a few seconds to read this quote on your own.
What I hope stands out to you is this four-part series. All right, let's clean this up a little bit so it makes a little bit more sense. Okay, I wanna draw your attention to the importance of activating prior knowledge, which is step one. Great teachers have an uncanny ability to teach students to access what they already know. When ideas are reawakened in our minds, our capacity to revise schemas and develop new ones becomes much, much more powerful. In other words, we become more receptive to new knowledge, which is the second step. The third step involves identifying similarities and differences. The reason strategy aid is so important is because it demands that students strengthen their schemas by actively manipulating and using their knowledge. What's key here is that this should be an active step and not a passive one. Students have already moved beyond the stage of passive recall. They're taking in knowledge, manipulating it, and using it. And finally, the fourth step is about application what students are going to do with their understanding. This is a critical final step because learning is consolidated here. Neural pathways and schemas are strengthened significantly when learning is extended to this level. When we match these four steps with blooms, a picture begins to develop. What do we want our students to know? What do we want our students to understand? And what do we want our students to be able to do? It seems to me that great teachers use the sequence, but they really separate themselves in the first and fourth steps. That is, great teachers have an uncanny knack for extracting prior knowledge from students, which is the first step, but they also excel at consolidating learning through authentic, hands-on activities, which is the fourth step. So when the authors claim that strategy aid is the core of all learning, I really don't think it's an exaggeration. Clearly this is a really powerful sequence, applicable to any subject and across every grade level at DAA. Ultimately the point is that students make meaning whenever they're allowed to identify similarities and differences, and that's really the essence of this strategy. Before we move on to the four discrete processes that are part of identifying similarities and differences, I just want to take a moment and talk about two related features of Robert Marzano's research. We all know how challenging or frustrating it can be teaching students how to process, retrieve, and remember information. But it's incredibly important, obviously. There's a huge difference between teaching students how to do these things and ex simply expecting them to be able to. Marzano's research indicates two important points. The first is that metacognition makes an enormous difference. And by metacognition, I simply mean thinking and reflecting about one's own mental processing. The second point is that explicit teaching makes a tremendous difference. And by explicit teaching, I simply mean modeling and guiding the specific processes and steps that are involved in thinking, instead of simply expecting a student to intuitively know how to complete a task. So I encourage you to think about those two things, metacognition and explicit teaching, because it can make a huge difference to your students' learning. There are two CITW strategies that are related here that I'd like you to connect with eight. They are strategy four, cues, questions, and advanced organizers, and strategy five, non-linguistic representations. If you combine these things together, I think a, a clear picture of really what great teaching looks like starts to form. All right, now let's move on to those four discrete processes that are part of identifying similarities and differences. To kick this off, I'm going to show a short video of B.J. Stone. B.J. Stone is one of the authors of Classroom Instruction That Works. Hi, I'm B.J. Stone. I'm an educational consultant at McCrell and one of the co-authors to Classroom Instruction That Works Second Edition, here today with your tip about identifying similarities and differences. I'm often asked two questions about identifying similarities and differences. The first one being, do I need to use all of the strategies in this category? And the second question being, which one of the strategies should I teach first? In answer to the first question, do I need to teach all of the strategies in this category, the answer is yes. Teachers need to teach the steps for comparing, classifying, 
creating metaphors, and creating analogies. They also need to provide students with adequate time to practice these strategies, giving them feedback along the way. Teachers who rely heavily on just comparing and classifying find that they shortchange their students in this category of strategies. It's important for teachers to move students slowly along in identifying metaphors and analogies, using metaphors and analogies, and finally equipping them so that on their own they can graduate to creating metaphors and analogies. In response to the second question, which strategy should I teach first, it's important that teachers understand that they have their students be well prepared in comparing before they move them into the other three strategies. We find that comparing is a gateway and cornerstone strategy into the work done as students classify, create metaphors, and create analogies. Remember that the strategy brief has two tables that will help you make further sense of these four processes. First on the front page, you've got a simple table that states when to use each strategy. And on the second page, you've got a more detailed table that defines the strategy and provides an instructional sequence for each one. All right, let's finish up. So there are 10 things I want to remind you of as you continue to think about strategy eight. Number 10. It's relevant in all subjects and at all grade levels. Number nine, variety matters and students need a range of experiences with this strategy. Number eight, the strategy is reinforced through metacognition, including think alouds and other reflective techniques. Number seven, the strategy is strengthened by frequent structured practice that is supported by high quality feedback. Number six, it begins with comparing before moving on to classifying, creating metaphors, and creating analogies. Number five, results in students being able to self-select and apply the appropriate process in academic contexts as well as in their lives. Number four, it demands explicit teaching, guiding, and modeling. Teachers shouldn't simply expect their students to use these sophisticated processes without showing them how to do it. Number three, move students beyond knowing and understanding to the higher order levels that require doing. Number two, the strategy requires students to access and use prior knowledge, thereby refining and developing schemas. And finally, number one, it is the essential strategy for making meaning of the world and what the authors say, uh, the core of all learning. All right, that's it. Uh, thanks for watching. I don't know if I've convinced you that strategy eight is the core of all learning or not. However, remember that you've got access to the chapters on the website. The final point that I'd make is the research behind all of these strategies comes from a meta-analysis that was done in 2010. And the importance of that is there really is a tremendous amount of research out there that confirms the importance of these strategies. So if you're interested, if you'd like to extend your study a little bit, I encourage you to have a look at those resources. Thanks.